We are live. Good afternoon and welcome to this community listening session co-hosted by the Boston School Committee and the Exam Schools Admissions Task Force. I'm Michael Contempassus, who along with Ms. Tanisha Sullivan serve as co-chairs of the task force. Because this is a remote session, I will ask Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Parvex to call a roll. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Contempassus. Dr. Coleman. Mr. DeRugio. Ms. Mercer. <coughs> Here. Mr. Tran. Mr. O'Neill. Ms. Robinson. Here. Thank you. Ms. Parvex. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Mr. Acevedo. Ms. Aguirre. Mr. Chernow. Here. Mr. Craiger. Dr. Prima Wisdom. Ms. Grassa. Ms. Lam. Ms. Nagasawa. Ms. Garrett. Dr. Tang. Ms. Waite. Ms. Sullivan. And Mr. Contempassus. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We are pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdean, Portuguese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Somali, and Arabic. After I finish introducing the interpreters, we will activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Our Spanish interpreter this afternoon is Luz Barreto Longus. Will you please invite our Spanish speaking audience to switch their Zoom channel in Spanish? Good afternoon. My name is Luz Barreto Longus. I will be your Spanish interpreter this afternoon. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Luz Barreto. Esta noche seré su intérprete de español y estaré en la sala de español. Para oír la interpretación simultánea, por favor busque el icono del globo del mundo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y toque donde dice interpretación para buscar los idiomas y seleccionar el español. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Our Cabo Verdean interpreter is Josiane Lopes. Will you please give the Zoom instructions in Cabo Verdean? Thank you, Mr. Contempassus. Good evening, everyone. Boa tarde, meu nome é Josiane. Sou de ser nos intérpretes para que a reunião li. Para ter acesso à interpretação simultânea, logo que está disponível, nos clica na ícone de globo na parte inferior de nosso ecrã e seleciona Cabo Verdeano. Se você só usa telemóvel, nos clica na três pontinhos e também nos seleciona Cabo Verdeano. Para qualquer pergunta, nos põe na chat. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you. Our Portuguese interpreter is Juan Bernal. Will you please give Zoom instructions in Portuguese? Yes, Mr. Contrapasses, how are you? Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am a Spanish Portuguese interpreter. For the purpose of this meeting, I will be interpreting in Portuguese for those in need of interpretation. I will now proceed to explain how to access the interpretation icon in Portuguese. Boa noite para todos. Meu nome é Juan Bernal. Eu sou um intérprete simultâneo para português designado para esta reunião de hoje. Para acessar o ícone da interpretação, o recurso da interpretação, olhe no globo na parte inferior da tela e selecione o português para escutar a minha interpretação em português. Se estivesse conectado de um telefone celular, olhe para a parte superior direita da tela do telefone celular. Tem três pontos, tem que selecionar o ponto da interpretação e selecione o português para escutar a minha interpretação em português. Muito obrigado pela tua presença. A gente se vê daqui a pouco. Thank you, Mr. Contempassus. Next interpreter may proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our Vietnamese interpreter this evening is Duyen Tru. Please give the Zoom instructions in Vietnamese. 
Dạ, xin chào quý vị, tôi là tên là Duyên Triệu, tôi sẽ thông dịch người Việt hôm nay. Nếu mà anh chị có cần ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt, xin chọn quả cầu và à, bấm vào tiếng Việt và tôi sẽ cung cấp thông dịch. <cười> Nếu mà máy điện thoại hoặc là máy vi tính không có phần mềm mới nhất thì xin hãy download phần mềm Zoom mới nhất có thể để có thể có cái sự thông dịch của chúng tôi. Thank you. Thank you. Our Cantonese interpreter this afternoon is Anna Say. Will you please give the Zoom instructions? in Cantonese. Thank you, Mr. Quantum Passes. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, I'm Anna. I'm going to talk to you about Chinese. If you want to see the Chinese word, you can see the Chinese word. You can see the Chinese word. If you want to use the phone, you can use the phone. If you want to use the phone, you can use the phone. If you want to use the phone, you can use the phone. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our Mandarin interpreter is Wei Li. Please give the Zoom instructions in Mandarin. Thank you, Mr. Quantum Buses. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm your Mandarin interpreter. My name is Wei. Dajiahao,我是您的普通话翻译. Uh, 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our Haitian Creole interpreter is Sergio Saint Hilaire. Please give the Zoom instructions in Haitian Creole. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Saint Hilaire, Haitian Creole interpreter. C'est un plaisir pour nous avoir aujourd'hui encore pour nous interpréter pour et que nous avons interprété en créole. Nous avons besoin de la conversation, nous avons cliqué en bas, en bas, et qu'on l'a, nous avons pris un globe, nous avons cliqué, nous avons entré là-dedans, nous avons choisi français. Et que moi-même, moi, là, pour nous faire du beau, c'est avec contentement que nous avons fait ça. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Our Somali interpreter is Fatuma Hassan. Please give the Zoom instructions in Somali. Galabudak sent the Mantin White in Salama, Magaiwa Fadim Hassan, Rahan Rabaina Idisha, who had the Aduba Hatan in Lady Interjumal Rodi in Somalia, who had seven a senti Bahaka and Telephon Kamisha Shasha the Hose, Sour Kakuyal or Kara Kara the Ah or Magaeda. At Kajus Green, he sit in a Thai, Somali, Smarka, Somali, Katab to Hakut Jumaya, Anina Okujuro in India. One had sent in Galabon accent. Thank you. Thank you. Our Arabic interpreter is Ahmed Al Rubaye. Please give the Zoom instructions in Arabic. Thank you. Marhaban, and I see Ahmed Al Rubaye, and I'm a Tajimel Gola Arabia Liadelio. We am Kanakum Listima Ale Tajimabil Gola Arabia, Mahila Dabila as Felishasha. ستشاهدون علامة الكرة الأرضية اضغط على هذه العلامة وستتمكن من رؤية اختيارات اللغات قم باختيار اللغة العربية وعندها ستتمكن من استماع إلى الترجمة باللغة العربية شكرا جزيلا Thank you sir Thank you Thank you all for assisting us this evening We will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. And we apologize and regret that we are unable to secure American Sign Language interpreters for today's session. The demand for ASL interpreters has increased tremendously during the pandemic as more public bodies are holding remote meetings. We continue to work with our partners at the state on this issue we will now activate the closed caption feature. Before we open it to public comment, I'd like to invite school committee chair, Jerry Robinson to say a few words. Ms. Robinson, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Content Passes. And thank you to Denisha Sullivan and the entire exam schools admission task force for leading this important work. The task force has been meeting since February, first weekly, and more recently, twice weekly, to really examine this issue, learn from other districts, and hear from all stakeholders. On behalf of the school committee, I want to thank you all for the countless hours that the task force has devoted to this process. Last week, the task force presented an update to the school committee, outlining potential areas for consideration. I encourage everyone to read that update 
which is posted on the committee's webpage at bostonpublicschools.org backslash school committee. The, the presentation has been translated into all of the major BPS languages. Tonight is an opportunity for us to hear from the community before the task force narrows down its final recommendation, which it will present to the school committee on June 30th. The committee will vote on a final exam school's admission policy on July 14th. For many people, this is an emotional issue. I understand that. I am a graduate of Girls Latin School, now Boston Latin Academy. I've also been both a parent and a grandparent in the district. I care deeply about all of our children. All parents want the best for their child. And I ask that you please keep your comments respectful and use this as an opportunity to learn from one another as we plan a path forward for our students. Before we move on to public comment, I want to make you aware of some changes we are implementing. Due to the unsettling tone and content of some recent remarks, we want to remind everyone that this is public comment and not public bullying. Hate speech of any nature is prohibited. We are here to listen to you so please be respectful. Also, as we did yesterday in moving forward, we will ask all speakers to turn on their cameras while making their remarks. We will now move on to public comment. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject, be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have nine speakers for general public comment. Each person will have three minutes to speak, and I'll remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. After we listen to those who have testified uh, signed up in advance to testify, we will um, be allowing uh, folks to raise their hands virtually. Um, so you can think about whether or not you'd like to testify, we'll be taking hands. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual committee or task force members. Thank you for your cooperation. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure that you're signed into Zoom with the same name you use to sign up for public comment. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you're from before you begin. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. As the chair said, moving forward to our next meeting, only speakers who turn on their camera will be allowed to testify. Otherwise, speakers can submit their testimony in writing. We'll begin this afternoon with Steve Yang, Anna Dorr, Sharon Hinton, and Domingo Starosa. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Is Steve Yang with us? Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, thank you for the... Um... Okay, can you, see, can you hear me? Can you see me now? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, last time I make a public uh, testimony, somebody uh, Google me, find me, find my work email and they send me an email 
um, try to um, uh, scare me away from the public testimony. Um, so um, now I just want to uh, give a further comment um, on the um, Miss Tang's uh, qualification as a public policy worker. Because uh, uh, first of all, um, I have this question because she is uh, she has this job. Okay, I don't think uh, she would take this uh, personally. Um, Mr. Yang, if I may. Uh, this is Mr. Quantum Passes, as yeah, you know, you. the co-chair. Um, I wish you would uh, keep your comments to the task at hand and not in any way talk about the individual members of the task force. I okay. think your comments in the past have been well uh, documented. Uh, we are here to listen and hopefully to review comments relative to the task and the charge of the task force. And I would beseech you to limit your comments to what you feel the recommendations should be. I would ask you to comply with my request. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Yes, um, I, I will. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, this, this I we learned that um, uh, Rosanna has been working in the field of education in equity and the critical race theory. However, she has never been in a educator, teacher, or principal. In addition, she had many other research in this field, so their calculations based on the outcome, such as the test score of GPAs has set, set dictionary, uh, this difference between these based on the outcome. Um, they can use family uh, wells to partially explain the difference between white and black. But how can they explain Asian, no matter their economic status that constantly do well on tests and have higher GPAs. They choose to ignore this part of the question because this part has the true answer to the question. And also a researcher who studied education equity is different from a professional educator. I have been a scientist studying cancer therapy for years. Um, I'm not a physician who can give advice to, uh, to cancer patients. In addition, thousands of a great biomedical research paper published has been published in top journals such as Cell, Nature, and Science every year. However, less than 5% can be translated to a clinical base. So this means her research on education equity could be also could also be wrong or useless. 20 seconds. Um, thank you. That's my uh, uh, that's my uh, my testimony today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna Dorr. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you see me? Okay, good. So, yeah. um, good afternoon. My name is Anna Dorr. I am a product of BPS and a parent of three BPS students in seventh, third, and first grade, and I live in West Roxbury. I have submitted more public comment over this past year than I have ever before in my life, but I feel passionately about making our schools more inclusive, more equitable, and more excellent. Um, I'd like to revisit some of my earlier public comments after listening to the latest school committee discussion. What struck me from that conversation is that the charge and timeline of the task force is misaligned with the scope of the problem. We need to devote this much, this much energy to ensuring every high school student receives the high quality, rigorous college or career preparatory education they are worthy of. 
I believe we can step towards that with the use of a lottery selection priority in the exam school admissions process. BPS could use its existing lottery assignment system for middle and high school students to offer this selection priority to students meeting the eligibility criteria defined by the task force, on which I hope you can find consensus. Um, qualified students would be eligible to rank the three exam schools, but also have the opportunity to rank and receive priority at other schools if they do not win or want an exam school seat. This could expand the energy and focus around the exam schools to the other high schools and other students of Boston. It could disrupt the notion that there are only three excellent BPS high schools. Um, as a result of this kind of lottery, we would likely see cohorts of these high achieving students enhancing a culture of excellence at other high performing BPS high schools. One day soon, I hope it doesn't matter where in Boston you go to school, that you will have every opportunity for enrichment, for rigor, and be equally prepared for college, career, and life. But right now, without waiting for new buildings or new schools to start up, this plan would give many more students the opportunity we say they deserve. That's all I've got. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Ms. Doerr. Um, our next speakers, I don't see them signed into the meeting. Sharon Hinton and Domingo Starosa. If you're with us, please raise your hand virtually. Uh, we'll move on to our next set of speakers. Um, can you please raise your hand, Mike Heishman, Patricia Kinsella, Kamani James, Rachel Meiselman, and Travis Marshall. And we'll begin with Mike Heishman. Now I'm on. Okay. The question before us today is as old as the history of the Americas. Who will benefit the most from our magnificent wealth and who will be deprived and suffer? Members of this committee, whose side are you on? Will you call for small steps that will provide a few additional seats for our black, brown and low income children so that they may enter our privileged schools? Or will you take a strong stand against racism, classism, and privilege and embrace excellence for all? All of you know that standardized tests are discriminatory tools used to maintain privilege. We have discussed the importance of maintaining rigor in our exam schools. Rigor means a commitment to privilege. Our system has maintained a rigor for the few while tolerating rigor mortis for the many. Our system has always provided Boston Latin School with gravy while allowing many of our children to attend unhealthy and deplorable buildings that starve from insufficient resources. Privilege for a few while many of our children are treated as deplorables. This has always been the history of BPS. Do you want change? Do you want excellence for all? If yes, you must abolish privilege. I agree with Chair Pearson, Jerry Robinson, that we need a system of magnet high schools, a system of excellent choices for all of our children. No more exam schools, no more walls which walk many of our children from entering. Instead, I call on you to support a lottery system and use zip codes to promote, promote greater race, class, and geographic diversity. What will happen to privileged parents to discover their privileged child may not enter the exam school? Many will scream. Some might, may find privileged solutions outside of the BPS. Thunder would shake the foundation of our school system and many of them for the sake of their children and the sake of our children would use their power and join our struggle for excellence for all. I call on all of you to choose justice instead of just us. Embrace excellence for all instead of maintaining privilege for a few. Seize the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. Our next speaker is Patricia Kinsella. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Patricia Kinsella. I am a former resident of Jamaica Plain, 
Um, we moved a year ago to Northfield out in Western Mass. Uh, last night, I spoke about the perils of using grade five MCAS scores in a revised admissions policy. This afternoon, I'd like to share the results of two academic studies as further food for thought. The first examined possible interventions to increase diversity at BLS, BLA, and the O'Brien. The second looked at the academic outcomes of college students who were not required to submit standardized test scores as part of the admissions process. In addition, I'd like to share surprising results from my own analysis of advanced placement data in a nearby district as a cautionary tale regarding future recommendations. Sorry about that. In 2018, the Rappaport Institute at Harvard examined several interventions that, that might diversify the student body at our three selective admissions schools with a focus on BLS. Of the interventions explored, using grade five MCAS scores as the sole, excuse me, one minute. I'll move myself. Sorry. Of the interventions explored, using grade five MCAS scores as the sole admissions criterion had the greatest impact, raising the percentage of black and Latino students at the school from 21% to 30%. But given that this increase still leaves us far from equity and given the glaring inadequacies of MCAS overall, use of the test for admissions would not be wise. So what can we learn from institutions of higher education that have removed test scores as a requirement for admission? In 2014, two former admissions officers at Bates College looked at the academic outcomes of over eight years of 30,000 students enrolled in colleges and universities, public and private, large and small, to explore this question. All of the schools were test optional, meaning they did not require test scores during the admissions process. Here's what the authors found. There was no statistically relevant difference in either the GPAs or the graduation rates between students who chose to submit test scores and those who did not. In other words, had the schools required test scores as a requirement for entry, they would have failed to admit a great many students who were fully capable of academic success with students from low-income homes, BIPOC students, and first-generation college attending students overrepresented in the group that would have been denied entry. Lastly, to consider the impact of teacher recommendations, I share my own professional experience reviewing advanced placement data for a nearby district. There was concern in the district's high school that too many unprepared or insufficiently motivated students were entering the AP program via the override process instead of entering via teacher recommendation. The district believed it needed to tighten AP entry requirements in order to weed out override students who were not succeeding in the rigorous program. When I compared AP exam scores and AP class grades of all students in the program, however, I found an unexpected pattern. The two groups, those in AP through teacher recommendation and those who petitioned for entry, performed identically on both the exams and class grades. Their scores and grade distributions were indistinguishable. Titan, I'm sorry, I'm afraid you're past your time. If you could please wrap up. Sure. Uh, yes, thank you. Like three sentences. Test scores may appear to be an objective method of identifying students for academic programs. They are not. They are instead demonstrably ineffective at identifying potential. Again, while the work of the task force is challenging, I have every confidence that you will make recommendations that uphold our shared values of fairness and opportunity for all. Thank you for this chance to testify. Thank you. And thank you for sending your uh, testimony in writing. We're going to share that with the task force and the committee. Our next speaker is Kamani James. Hello, am I, am I next? Yes, you are. Okay, good afternoon all. My name is Kamani James. I'm a recent graduate of BLA, former student representative on the Boston School Committee and an appalling truth teller and advocate. I just wanna start by saying how funny that now the chair of the school committee says that hate speech isn't allowed at public comment due to comments such as quote, I hate white people that have been said recently, something I've said myself. Yet when white folks were literally dragging people of color, that warning was never explicitly said. 
Anyways, I was asked by two individuals to come and make public comment testimony today, since too many privileged, entitled, and racist people have been dominating these meetings while spewing pure ignorance. It's no secret that I'm against the existence of exam schools, and I know, I know what I'm about to say may be perceived as counterintuitive to the conversations you all have been having these past several months, but let this serve as a sort of premonition to what is to come for BPS. The existence of exam schools reinforces a hierarchical education system tied with capitalism and classism while upholding white supremacy. Let me say that again. The existence of exam schools reinforces a hierarchical education system tied with capitalism and classism while upholding white supremacy. For years, children are indoctrinated and told that exam schools are for the most successful. And what child wouldn't want to be successful? But little do they know, they have to have the money and resources to even prepare themselves to make it to the exam schools. And if it hasn't run for anyone yet, this is where capitalism and classism starts to come into play. So many Black and Latina children and families don't have the money, resources, or social status to attain this so-called college preparatory education because historically, white people did everything they could to make sure we didn't have the generational wealth or modern day income to adequately provide for ourselves and our families. Put simply, BPS will never be an anti-racist district if it continues to uphold these racist structures and tolerate the people who protect them, period. So what do you, so what do I want, you may ask? I want every school to offer a rigorous, diverse, expansive education to all students, regardless of where they come from and what they look like, without capitalistic and racist barriers like a standardized test getting in the way. I want white people to stop thinking that they're entitled to more just because they've always gotten what they've wanted and through colonizing at that. To the members of this task force, especially Michael Contempathis, I already know you're not ready to discuss the things I've brought up today because your conversations have been avoiding it. But in a few years, when this racist structure proves yet again to be a threat to your so-called efforts of making BPS an anti-racist district, and you have to come back to the table to decide what you will do, you will see, mark my words. History will remember you all as individuals who simply lack the courage to create real long lasting change and essentially settle for upholding white supremacy. Quite frankly, it's embarrassing this and I'm embarrassed for you all. Time. That's, I'm glad because that was my last sentence. Goodbye. Our next speaker is Rachel Meiselman. Can you hear me? Yes, we Hello? can. Okay, fine, you thank you. Good. Good evening, I'm a proud alumna of the Robert Gould Shaw Middle School and Boston Latin School. While it is not my wish to be antagonistic, I do not feel that it is entirely appropriate to strike a conciliatory tone, given the extraordinary circumstances. There is still a stubborn refusal to acknowledge that admission to one of the three exam schools represents a culmination of hard work. Yet there has been little, if any, acknowledgement of the work that must be done to improve the feeder schools. There also seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding of what an exam school is. They are not schools for everyone. Now, that in no way means that not every child deserves a quality education. Not at all. At every stage of his education, a child deserves to be nurtured and challenged. Further, saying that the exam schools are not for everyone is in no way stating or even implying that gifted children are not present in every school. Not at all. I believe that all children have gifts. So there must be serious efforts in that case, not only to improve the primary schools, but also secondary schools. All children all deserve academic institutions in which they can thrive and realize their gifts. In short, our children merit a constellation of schools at every level of their education so that they can all fill their potential 
and be proud ambassadors of Boston. I want to add, though, when closing, that the activities that have taken place to supposedly answer the question that doesn't need to be asked, what can we do to fix the exam schools? I have to regretfully say that these activities have set race relations back in the city of Boston, back decades. And I also wanna say on a very last note, in a previous meeting, and I say this respectfully, that there was talk about this is the hill that I'll die on. Well, I'm willing to die on a hill, a few in fact. The first, to preserve the rigor as it's understood at the exam schools, to preserve that for people who, can, who, are, who are ready and willing to come after me. 20 seconds. I'm also, I'm also willing to die on the hill of fighting to improve all the feeder schools in the city of Boston and working assiduously to improve the secondary ones. And also to defend Mr. Conopassus, whom I know is Mr. C, who told me so many years ago that I was just as good as anyone else and that I had the potential to be anything that I wanted to be. And he has done this for countless students for decades long before there were the concepts of equity and systemic racism. You had this man, Mr. Conopasis, Mr. C, who was fighting to ensure that all students of this city are educated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My next speaker is Travis Marshall. After Mr. Marshall, we'll open it up to any other attendees who wish to testify, you can just raise your hand virtually. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Travis Marshall. I live in Roslindale and have both a rising fifth and second grader in Boston Public Schools. So to be clear, this is an issue that will directly impact my children in the coming years. I'm also a member of Quality Education for Every Student, or Quest. I appreciate the amount of work this task force has dedicated to discussing this issue and to hearing from the public. And I just like to push back against the idea that a lottery system somehow punishes kids who play by the rules. That phrase connotes some objective and immutable truth about these rules as if they were carved into stone tablets when in reality, the rules are whatever we decide them to be. For decades, we've had a set of rules that created a consistent outcome, specifically a Latin school student body that is roughly the inverse of the district's demographics. That is the system we created. It doesn't mean it's the right system or the students who play by the rules of that system are more worthy of the opportunities readily available at these selective schools. It also doesn't mean that changing that system will somehow spell the end of these schools. As you know, before 1963, there was no exam of any kind required for admission. Later, for more than 20 years, leading up to the McLaughlin suit in the 90s, there was a, dis a different set of rules, including set-asides to ensure underrepresented students gained entry. Mr. C was head of school for some time of that era and was quoted saying that over, this, over time, this system worked to the advantage of all three schools. None of the many alumni comments to this body have referred to those years as somehow tarnished by that set of rules. Obviously, we can't return to that system, but it raises the point that we get the outcomes we design for. Using high stakes testing for admission to selective schools will continue the inequitable outcomes we have seen since the 90s. Efforts to work within the current system like the exam school initiative have shown middling results. While this year's temporary departure from that system resulted in invitations that were far more racially, geographically, and economically diverse. So I ask you to please not lock yourself into a mindset, excuse me, a mindset that there is only one way to deem a student worthy. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. 
We'll now open it up to any attendees who wish to testify. Please raise your hand virtually. Susie McGlone. If you could please unmute yourself, turn on your camera and tell us what neighborhood you're from. Hi, my name is Susie McClone. I am from Back Bay. And I just wanted to make a public comment upon um, all of this. As far as the exam schools go, I think that's a very important issue that many people have brought up, how it has been racist throughout the years. And I also just want to make a public comment about the idea that um, hate speech will not be tolerated. And I think that that is very true, or should be very true and is very important. But I think we need to recognize that when someone from, especially a student is saying that they hate white people, that that is something that is being said to, I guess, just express the reality of what has been happening in our school system. It's been, a racist school system since I've been working with it. And it has continually on and on benefited a certain group of families and students and even teachers. So I just want us to be very clear about what is hate speech and um, what is not hate speech. And so I would just like to put myself on the record as to making a comment about that because I think it's really important to make sure that we aren't just excusing what have been decades and centuries of racism in our country to um, then, you know, accuse or I guess um, intimate that when people are expressing what has happened to them in this very racist system and their feelings on it to be hate speech. So that's what I wanted to say and also I do, I would like to see um, schools open for all students and not just for students that can pass a test that seems, well, has been proven to be biased and racist. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Pregazer. You could please unmute Turn on your camera and tell us what neighborhood you're from, Teresa. <laughs> um, hi, yes, I live in um, Roxbury and I have a, um, a sixth grader who will be going to BLA next year and I have a uh, rising fifth grader. Um, and I just want to say that I, I followed the exam school um, situation for my sixth grader, but I have not been following it as closely um, since then. So I, I really am not um, current on all the different options, but I did, I did hear, and I know you said not to specifically mention people, but I would like to say I did hear what... Um, Jerry Robinson said about just the idea of there not being winners and losers and that um, expanding exam schools. And, um, and I do wanna just support that idea. And I also support the um, previous speaker that said, you know, she's willing to die on the hill of it being rigorous. I do think that these schools are not for everyone. And my son is going there, but it's because, and he's going to BLA and I didn't, we chose BLA over BLS because I didn't feel like BLS was the right school for him. And I don't think these schools are right for every child, but I do think that they should be preserved for the kids who they are intended for. And that does mean, of course, all the kids in Boston. Um, I don't think it should, I do think it should be, um, I do think that equity should be considered and the highest priority. Um, what I do wanna say is just, um, I do think exams do have a place. Grades are subjective and they, you know, the teacher, the relationship with the students, the teacher affects grades. 
Um, but what if it was an exam that just was a base requirement? Like it wasn't, right now it's used to rank, right? The amount, the, the, the test, um, the score you get on a test gives you a complete score and then there's a cutoff. But what if the test was just a baseline to see whether um, kids qualify or not qualify, but there was enough room for all the kids? I think that would be a better goal um, to have just enough spots for all the kids that um, these schools are intended to serve. Um, that's my main contribution, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Tower Lowen. Hi, so uh, my name is Cindy Tower Lowen. I am not a Boston resident. I happen to be someone who is concerned about the task force, the charge, as well as exam schools and BPS. Um, I have watched, or shall I say, listened to many of the, to, to first and foremost, the work that you guys have done. And I appreciate many many of the tough conversations that have taken place. Um, I also have listened to parents and community members um, within the public comment. And I believe that two, at least two members of this task force were, in my opinion, targeted um, very unjustly. Um, and I think that um, it's a very difficult place to be for any member of the task force here. And yet, um, you know, one is um, of Asian descent and one is black. And I just think that that is telltelling of what has transpired um, in terms of this work. Um, I would suggest, um, and I know this is probably too late, but that the, um, interim policy be extended another year just because of the COVID piece and the impact that that has had on so many students and families. Um, that does not diminish any of the work that you guys have done. Um, I would love to see what that data would show for, for actually a second year in terms of the school year because it was such a, a pivotal time for the students. Um, and for the task force that is here to be reconvened um, with these members in terms of going forward and continuing this work so that there is a, more time in terms of getting it at the best that you can at this point. And I know that um, consensus is something that you are trying to do. Um, I don't know if it ultimately will be consensus or it will end up being a vote, which may, may, may or may not take place um, tomorrow. Anyway, I, I do also want to make one comment regarding hardworking students in rigor. Um, any student at BPS should have the same opportunity to have rigor as well as hardworking. I don't know how many students I have come across that are not hardworking and whether or not they are part of the rigor is another thing in terms of BPS. But to, and to say that the rigor will be diminished because of the fact that um, there is more opportunity for black and brown students at the exam schools is racially targeted period. And I don't know what else to say about that. Anyway, I thank you for your time and the work that you guys have done. And I appreciate the two co-chairs immensely in terms of keeping everything um, even keel for the most part. Thank you. thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Vanessa Calderon-Rosado. And if there are any other speakers, um, 
uh, attendees rather who wish to speak, please raise your hand virtually. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, I uh, had a bit of a technical problem. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today in front of the exam schools admissions policy task force. My name is Vanessa Calderon Rosado. I am the chief executive officer of EBA in Quilinos Periguas en Acción, a community development corporation in Boston South End, providing affordable housing and education, financial empowerment, and arts programs. I am here today to urge the a task force to adopt an inclusive and fair exam school admission policy. Boston's exam schools are highly regarded as public education. However, many of our students, especially Latinx students, are not able to access such uh, wonderful education. The admission process that we're accustomed to based solely on test scores and grades are, is significantly flawed and disproportionately excludes Black and Latino students. The percentages of Black and Latino sixth and eighth graders given the opportunity to enroll Boston Latin School in 2017 were more than two and a half times below their district-wide enrollment rates. And we know we can do better. We must move away from the exam that does not align with state standards and fails to test on topics not taught in BPS. The exam's flaws perpetuate privilege for families able to hire tutors to prepare their children for the test. The temporary change in exam school admissions enacted during COVID-19 shows that changes in admission policies result in a more inclusive student body that reflects the makeup of our great city. Black applicants increased their share of total substances, rising to 24% from 18% last year. And Latino applicants represent 28% of acceptances this year, or from up from 24% last year. So I'm here to ask you to please increase opportunities for all students by adopting the following recommendations and proposals. For example, a proposal that BPS invite a top percentage of students in each public school to attend the BPS high schools of their choice. Proposals that BPS invite a top percentage of students in each zip code to attend the BPS high school of their choice. Proposals that BPS employ a holistic model to evaluate students individually and seek to admit, admit an academically excellent class that is diverse across multiple dimensions, including socioeconomic status, school of attendance at the time of application, artistic or athletic ability, community service, race, ethnicity, prior attendance to BPS schools, and zip code. I thank you so much for your time and appreciate the work that you're doing and the leadership that you're showing in this process. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a speaker who will be using interpretation services. Uh, Shirley Cheng Wen has requested Cantonese. I will now turn off the interpretation icon. Interpreters in the public will all be in the main room. Interpreters, please stop interpreting. Hi, Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Hello, I continue. Hi, you are speaking Cantonese. 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 Hi, you Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, yeah, yeah, my last, uh, what I 
，原嚟我哋前几年咧去到。啊！拉丁学校嘅学生有九十几个，但系上一年咧，我哋得得三十位学生入到去拉丁三间学校，佢嘅啊机会率系降低咗百分之七十。嗯 ，OK。So um hello everyone. Um I want to I'm here to um speak for my group and that group is the Josiah Quincy School. That um on behalf of the parents, um I want to talk to you about Um, the exam admission, uh, the exam school admission. Last year, we have in the past year, we have about ninety、um, students get into the exam school、um, in the past previous years before COVID.、Um, but then, with the new、um, admission policy, it's only thirty some students. Thirty students get in. It's about seventy seventy percent decrease, and this is very concerning. And ah, can you talk about? OK， 咁樣咧，我哋啊亞裔學生咧覺得我哋受到被人不重視，剝奪咗我哋學啊細路仔嘅入學嘅權力，同埋咧我哋從佢哋幼稚園開始咧已經係加強咗佢哋學習方面嘅方向，例如補習啊啊或者課課外加強啊啊練習啊，咁樣去提高佢哋嘅水平。但係咧，舊一年咁樣嘅疫情咧，將我哋所有嘅心機。心血都白白浪费咗咯。嗯 ，OK。得好。嗯 ，OK。Um, she said that so we feel very being very disrespected about what happened to the recent admission that a lot of student, um, a lot of good student in our neighborhood not giving the opportunity to get into these exam school and um, all these kids. We've been training them and really involved in the education since they're in kindergarten and elementary school. We work really hard to provide, try our best to provide tutoring and try to train them academically and to to have a lot of practice in so many ways. Just try to give them an opportunity to go to exam school. And what happened last year?、Um, it's really、um, heart heartbreaking, and we felt like. Um, all our hard work for all these years were in vain. Okay, so okay. Okay. 咁然后咧，我哋又觉得好似例如佢哋如果继续唔用考试嘅话，咁拉丁学校嘅宗旨已经系全部摧毁咗啦。因为你要根据佢学生啊嘅、呃、能力啊，佢、呃、嘅真材实料啊，同埋佢嘅 repair 先可以去到呢间学校。如果佢唔达标嘅咧，我建议嗰啲学生咧。就係留翻原嚟嘅公立校學校比較好咯。嗯 ，so my con what I really concerning is if you're not using exam as an assessment, how do you really maintain vigor in in the exam school? The exam school is not for everyone, and we it's important to maintain、um, the vigor and then allow student who has the ability、um, to. To perish in these schools, so we believe if the student are not meeting the ability、um, that is good enough for the exam school, perhaps it is best for them to stay in a different school. That's all. Okay, 我哋百分之七十嘅学位系俾人其他族裔、其他地区嘅学生攞咗去。你话嗌我哋呢班优秀嘅学生系咪白白咁啊埋没咗佢哋？本應可以得到更好教育，咁樣而浪費咗呢個誒咁嘅人才咧。嗯、uh, mm. ，so we believe compared to the past seventy percent of of students was not getting the placement、um, that they deserve、um, because those those、um, admission、um, availability was distributed in different zip codes. So we believe a really good In our in our neighborhood, all our really good students are not giving the choice they were supposed to going to these exam school to further、um, the education. If continue to not get fair treatment, we don't we our young people don't exclude the legal means to get into the court or the judge or the highest court. We hope to get fair treatment. Okay.、Um, if our voice is not being heard and And if we we believe if we are not getting fair, fair treatment, we are we are considering in the future we will、um, 
we will seek a way in the legal system, maybe a lawsuit or some other way to try to get our voice to be heard and then to get justice. Well, they just came on. Okay, Ms. Chen Wing, I'm afraid you're past your time. Okay, so sorry. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now activate the interpretation icon and all interpreters will be sent back to your channels so you can begin interpreting again. Thank you. Do we have any other attendees who wish to speak today? Please raise your hand virtually. This will be the last call to give testimony. Mr. Contempasis, we have no other speakers this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Um, before I go to my closing comments, I would like to uh, uh, recognize that three additional members of the task force have joined us during the course of this meeting. Uh, school leaders, Grasa and Skerritt, and one of our parent representatives, Ms. Aguirre, for the record. I don't see my co-chair on the uh, screen. So I want to thank everyone who spoke and shared their unique perspective. The testimony that was given is very important to the task force and to the school committee and rest assured that we will review uh, the uh, statements, both written and oral, that were given today. The next remote meeting of the exam schools admissions task force will take place tomorrow, Thursday, June 24th at 5 p.m. The Zoom link and all information related to the task force can be found at bostonpublicschools.org backslash ESA task force. The task force will present its final recommendations to the school committee on June 30th. If there is nothing further, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Parvex, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Contapasis. I see that uh, Task Force member Zena Lum has also joined the meeting. Oh, so welcome. terrific. Thank you for pointing that out. Dr. Coleman? Mr. De Arrujo, Mr. Tran, Mr. O'Neill, Ms. Robinson. You. Thank you. Ms. Parvex. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Mr. Acevedo. Ms. Aguirre. Yes. Mr. Trano. Yes. Mr. Scrager. Dr. Freeman Wisdom. Ms. Grassa. Yes. Ms. Lam. Yes. Ms. Nagasawa, Ms. Garrett. Yes. Dr. Tang, Ms. Waite, Ms. Sullivan. Abstain. And Mr. Contempasis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The listening session is adjourned. Good afternoon. <laughs>